Hello and welcome class to the conclusion of chapter 15. So thus far we have talked about entropy and the second law of thermodynamics as well as the third law of thermodynamics, uh, which are all focused around entropy and its place in spontaneous reactions. So as we saw in our previous lecture specifically, so long as the entropy uh, change of the universe is increasing, we can conclude that our corresponding reaction is spontaneous. Now what we're going to be learning about today is another way to think about that same concept using Gibbs free energy. So before we really jump into any calculations, let's assess who Gibbs was. All right, so Gibbs, his first name, or his full name, being J. Willard Gibbs, uh, lived from 1839 to 1903. Robert Millikan, who was the same scientist of the oil drop experiment, same Millikan, uh, stated of Gibbs, in pure science, Gibbs did for thermodynamics what Laplace did for celestial mechanics and what Maxwell did for electrodynamics. Namely, he made his field a nearly finished theoretical structure. In other words, Gibbs was the scientist who saw all of these pieces relating to enthalpy and entropy and put them together, correlating them to spontaneous reactions. The work that we have been studying so far is the work of Gibbs. So what we are going to continue with then, what or in this lecture specifically, was how Gibbs wrapped up everything thus far with a really nice bow, creating, as Melikin put it, a nearly finished theoretical structure for the understanding of spontaneous reactions. All right, so what we're going to do is derive what is known as Gibbs free energy. We're gonna start with the second law of thermodynamics. Right, the consistent observation that if the entropy change of the universe is greater than zero, if it is increasing, we are working with a spontaneous reaction. All right, so our first step, like what we're, what we're kind of working towards is to create an equation where all of the subscripts correspond to that of the system. That way we don't have to go out of our way to uh, try and figure out anything about the surroundings or even the entire universe. The goal would be to just have to assess the system to determine whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. Well, if the goal is to get everything into the subscript of the system, our delta S of cis is already perfectly fine the way it is. We are going to uh, insert the, um, or substitute our delta S of surroundings with the other equation that we learned in our previous lecture, the fact that our entropy change of the surroundings is equal to the negative enthalpy of the system divided by t. And of course, if we're working with an equation, we need to keep the other side of the equation. So we're going to say that this combination of the system and the, or the yes, entropy of the system and the enthalpy of the system divided by t has to be greater than zero. And if that's true, then we're working with a spontaneous reaction. However, it can be messy to work with uh, fractions. So our next step, our next goal, is going to be to get all of our variables here in the same line. That way we're, there are no denominators. We don't need to worry about division, messing with our uh, greater than or less than sign, all depending on what, <laughs> what direction it's facing. So we're going to add our enthalpy of the system divided by t to the right-hand side, giving us the entropy of the system has to be greater than the enthalpy of the system divided by t, again, for a spontaneous reaction. If this equality is true, the reaction is spontaneous. But again, our goal here is to get everything, all of our variables in the same line. So we're going to take our t and multiplying it or multiply it up to the left hand side. So t times the entropy of the system has to be greater than the enthalpy of the system in order for a reaction to be spontaneous, which is fine, but it's also really nice, again, to have kind of a benchmark of zero. That way you know if something is greater than or less than, we can figure out uh, at a really straightforward glance whether or not our uh, you know reaction is going to be spontaneous. So last but not least, we are going to take our T delta S and move it to the right hand side, zero must be greater than the combination of the enthalpy of our system 
minus our temperature times the entropy of our system for a spontaneous reaction. All right, so really what we did here was just took some variables that were kind of straightforward to work with, inserted uh, like the delta H, again, our enthalpy divided by T here because our goal was to get everything in a really nice straightforward equation with the subscripts only corresponding to the system. Now we do not need to pay attention to the surroundings explicitly in order to determine whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. We call the equation that we just derived the Gibbs free energy equation, which is represented with the variable of delta G. This is the maximum energy released by a process occurring at constant temperature and pressure. Maximum energy released, meaning that we are observing not just the heat through our enthalpy, but also the dispersion of the energy through the entropy. So we're looking at the whole picture here. What the Gibbs free energy equation observes is the spontaneity of a reaction given again that we have our enthalpy and our entropy changes of the system. In our class, for example, this would be considered to be a chemical reaction. So we can see that the uh, delta H minus T delta S that we just solved for is set equal to be equal to delta G, delta G being equal to free or Gibbs free energy. So in other words, as we just found, so long as the delta H minus T delta S is less than zero, the same thing can be said of delta G. So long as our delta G is negative, so long as it is less than zero, according to the derivations that we just saw, based off of the second law of thermodynamics, our reaction is going to be a spontaneous reaction. Well, what was the real advantage of deriving such an equation, right? Why, did, why couldn't we just stick with the second law of thermodynamics? We had a perfectly good equation there. Why is it useful to look at the spontaneity of our reactions from the Gibbs free energy perspective instead? The main reason why it's useful to observe Gibbs free energy uh, through the equation we just derived is that we can make some generalizations on the spontaneity of our reaction based off of the construction of the equation itself, namely the balance of our enthalpy and our temperature times entropy. You see, normally entropy is going to be a very small number and enthalpy is going to be a relatively large number. Now, this is not always true, but it tends to be true since the heat exchange of a reaction is oftentimes larger than the dispersion of the heat throughout the process. And we can uh, see that there is a negative sign right here in the equation. This leads to a balance between the enthalpy and the entropy, where again, we're looking for the uh, you know, combination, <laughs> the result of this equation to be negative for a spontaneous reaction. If the combination is positive, that means that we're going to be working with a non-spontaneous reaction. All right, so we know that both the enthalpy and the entropy throughout a process can be positive or negative. So what controls this balance and what leads to a spontaneous or a non-spontaneous reaction is not just the enthalpy and the entropy, but also our temperature. The temperature is able to scale up or scale down this entropy portion of the equation, which can lead to either an increase or a decrease in the entropy's uh, importance as we're considering whether or not this reaction will be spontaneous. So what we have in the table down below is a combination of whether or not the enthalpy and the entropy would be negative and positive. Um, so our first two rows here where the enthalpy is negative are going to correspond to exothermic reactions and the next two columns are going to correspond to endothermic reactions, right? So if we're thinking conceptually here, a reaction can either release heat through an exothermic process or absorb heat through an endothermic process. This is exactly what leads to the delta H being negative or positive, respectively. The entropy doesn't have a really nice label like exothermic, endothermic, so we're just going to consider the entropy to be positive or negative in both of these cases, and we can draw some conclusions about whether or not our delta G is likely going to be positive or negative as a result.
All right, I've cleaned up the equation a little bit. I'm gonna need some space for illustrations and to get an understanding for what I'm getting at here, uh, let's just observe the first row and draw some conclusions about whether or not this reaction we would assume is going to be spontaneous or non-spontaneous and when. Not only depending on the H and the S, but also as we can see in the table on the temperature. All right, so the first uh, scenario here corresponds to an exothermic reaction that is going to have a negative enthalpy. With a negative number will come a spontaneous reaction. Specifically, a negative delta G comes a spontaneous reaction. So if our enthalpy is negative, corresponding to an exothermic reaction, this could be or could lead to the driving force of a spontaneous reaction if the overall delta G ends up being negative. So we can see in the right-hand side of the equation, we are subtracting out the entropy. So if the entropy value inside of this delta S is positive, that means regardless of the temperature, we're always going to be subtracting out a number. And as we know, a negative minus a positive is just going to be another negative number. This first row corresponds to a situation where it doesn't matter what the temperature is, this form of a reaction that is exothermic and yet also increases the entropy of the universe will always be spontaneous. So that's sort of what we're looking at here, the balance of the negative and the positive. And this first row is one of the easiest situations to consider because a negative number minus a positive number is going to be a negative delta G no matter what temperature we're at. It doesn't matter how the entropy is impacting this reaction. Exothermic reactions favor spontaneity as well as an increase in entropy favors spontaneity. So both of these situations are like, heck yes, spontaneous reaction and therefore, our delta G is negative. Well, what happens in the second row when our reaction is still exothermic, this delta H is still negative, but in this case, our delta S is negative as well. Well, since the delta S is negative in the second row, the negative of a negative becomes a positive. Well, we're running into the situation here where the entropy now is no longer working with the enthalpy. They're going to be working against each other. So what I'm gonna do here to really show the balance is to uh, like just take the negative sign for our entropy, which again comes from the position in the table that we're considering right here. Uh, negative a negative is a positive. So I'm just gonna add this little plus sign right here to be really explicit. The enthalpy, our delta H, is going to be tipping the reaction towards being spontaneous. The entropy though, because it is decreasing, could lead to a non-spontaneous reaction if it's positive enough to overcome the negative of the enthalpy in terms of like the magnitudes of these two numbers. What's gonna make the difference here is the value of T. You see, again, since the entropy magnitude tends to be lower then the enthalpy, since this S, chances are, is going to be a smaller number than the delta H. In order for this decrease in the entropy to take over, we're going to have to be working at a very, very high temperature, right? So high temperature, a very large T, multiplied by a low entropy, a very small S, could still lead to a large enough number to overtake the delta H, giving us overall a positive delta G. So if we are working at very high temperatures in this situation, a high temperature is going to lead to a non-spontaneous reaction. And if we're considering the opposite side of the spectrum where not uh, the T is not increasing, but rather the T is decreasing, what we're doing here is minimizing the impact of the entropy. So if we're taking a very small T uh, and multiplying it by a very small s, this number ends up being essentially negligible and the enthalpy, which is exothermic, will lead to the overall reaction being or having a negative delta G and being spontaneous as a result.
All right, just to make it really clear here, looking at two different, two different rows. So at low temperatures, an exothermic reaction that has a decrease in entropy will be spontaneous, and at high temperatures, it will be non-spontaneous. Now, a really good example of this, before we keep moving forward, is the rusting of iron, the uh, explicit entropy of which we've already calculated. So we found that the entropy change of the universe for the rusting of iron, as we take a solid and combine it with a gas and create a solid, the entropy here uh, for the system is going to be negative. So this overall reaction has a negative delta S of the system. However, we already saw that this reaction is also exothermic. So here we have literally the an example of what we're talking about here. Like the reaction is overall exothermic. This is going to be releasing heat to the surroundings, which is, as we saw, what leads to the reaction being spontaneous. But what's really awesome and like kind of crazy is that this reaction is only spontaneous at what we consider to be quote unquote low temperatures. As we increase the temperature of this reaction, what we're doing is increasing the impact that the entropy has. In other words, in order for this reaction to be spontaneous, it has to be able, has to be able to release heat. And I don't know if you've ever considered this kind of situation before, but if the environment around your reaction is too hot, then the reaction cannot release its heat. It's almost like you put this energetic stopper on the reaction. So if the temperature around your iron as it's combining with oxygen is too high, the uh, system, the reaction itself, cannot physically release its heat. Just due to the balance of thermal energy, the surroundings, if they get to be too hot, will actually be putting some heat into the system, which stops our reaction from being able to progress. It stops it from being spontaneous. All right, now that I've cleaned off my equation again, let's consider the other side of enthalpy. Let's consider the endothermic reactions in rows three and four here. So the first combination we're looking at is a positive enthalpy. So again, our, en our uh, endothermic reaction with a positive entropy. So if our reaction's enthalpy is positive, this means that the enthalpy is going to be leaning towards a non-spontaneous reaction we are going to need the entropy to take over, which we can see here is going to be the case since we're taking a negative uh, of a positive, we're gonna be subtracting out this positive entropy value, meaning that if our entropy is very high, we're going to be subtracting out a very large number and ultimately the endothermic reaction is going to be pushed forward because of the compensation from the entropy increase of the uh, reaction itself. So in order to make sure that our entropy here is taking over, we're going to need a very high temperature, meaning that endothermic reactions can become spontaneous at relatively high temperatures if their entropy value is increasing for this reaction. And as we would expect, if the uh, temperature actually is not very large, if it is very low, we're also going to be, uh, or we will as a result, not be subtracting out a very large number. This component here ends up being negligible. The positive enthalpy ends up taking over. Our Gibbs free energy ends up being positive as a result, and we will uh, have a non-spontaneous reaction as a result. All right, so the second row and the third row lead to the trickiest sorts of situations uh, when observing reactions because the enthalpy in one case says spontaneous versus the entropy says not and vice versa. So the temperature component in rule or uh, rows two and three here is going to be or have, lead to a very large impact on whether or not this reaction is going to be spontaneous or not. All right, row four is going to be another situation where it's kind of easy to observe because our reaction is endothermic, so I'm gonna keep this plus sign here. Again, meaning that our enthalpy is tending towards non-spontaneous. And the entropy change in row number four is also negative, meaning that, uh, actually, let me clean this up first uh, before I keep going, before I keep going, let me clean this up. All right, that's better. 
All right, so our entropy is also negative here, and a negative of a negative is a positive. So we're taking a positive number, and we're going to be adding to it positive numbers, meaning that our Gibbs free energy is always going to be positive in this case, and as a result, this combination of an endothermic reaction which decreases entropy will always be non-spontaneous. All right. So in conclusion, we have two situations in which uh, something is always going to be the case. So whether it's always being spontaneous or always being non-spontaneous, we also have two uh, slightly trickier situations where there's going to be a balance that we need to consider. Whether the exothermic nature of the reaction is going to be strong enough to allow the reaction to be spontaneous, or if the increase in entropy is going to be strong enough to allow the reaction to be spontaneous. And in these latter, or these uh, two like cases in between, row number two and row number three, the temperature is going to play a huge role in whether or not the reaction will actually end up being spontaneous. All right, so let's just work through one real quick example problem. We're not being asked here to qualitatively assess whether or not the reaction is going to be spontaneous, but rather we are going to calculate uh, based off of the enthalpy of fusion for our ice, as well as the entropy change of the system, what is our Gibbs free energy? So we're actually just gonna be using the delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S equation here. So I'm gonna give you the chance to work through this problem on your own. The equation itself is not too tricky to work with. So what do you think? Is this reaction where we're taking ice and leaving it in a cup of water, will this spontaneously uh, melt into water or will it not? Spoilers, we kind of already know based off of past experience whether or not this reaction, this physical change of solid ice to liquid water will be spontaneous, but we're gonna see here explicitly what the Gibbs free energy also has to say about it. So feel free, crush the numbers, and we'll come back together in a minute. All right, welcome back. So let's insert our enthalpy and our entropy into the equation for Gibbs free energy, calculate our delta G. All right, so first and foremost, our delta H is uh, explicitly given to us in the wording of the problem. The enthalpy of fusion for water is 6.01 kilojoules per every mole of ice that we have. We are next going to have to subtract out a temperature. Well, we can see that the temperature here is given in degrees Celsius. And the question may be asked, do I have to convert this temperature to Kelvin or not? In order to answer that question, what we can turn to is the entropy that is provided and see that the entropy does have a temperature unit of Kelvin here. What this tells us is that the temperature that we're working with should also be converted to Kelvin in order to be, uh, or, or in, <laughs> in order to work with the other variables that are being inserted into this equation. So if we convert 25 degrees Celsius into Kelvin, we find a value of 298.15 K. This number might be starting to look familiar since we work at room temperature a lot. So 298.15 Kelvin, we can insert here. And our entropy, we can see is in joules per mole Kelvin, whereas our enthalpy was in kilojoules per mole. So here's another value that we need to watch out for. Oftentimes, uh, enthalpies are given in kilojoules just because, again, they're such they're normally larger numbers, uh, as opposed to the entropy, which is given in joules because it's a slightly smaller number. So we need to make sure that we are converting again our uh, values here, the energy units, to all be in the same unit. I'm just going to convert the uh, entropy into kilojoules. So I'm going to say we're working with 0.022 kilojoules per Kelvin mole. And this is going to be what I insert into the equation for delta S, 0.022 kilojoules per Kelvin mole. And so now we have uh, an equation that we can use to straightforwardly calculate our delta G and find that the value here is equal to negative 0.556. And the unit here, we can see the Kelvins are going to cancel out in the entropy piece, but what is left over in both uh, the enthalpy and the entropy is in kilojoules per mole. All right, well, it definitely looks like our delta G here is less than zero. It is a negative number. 
So because our delta G is a negative number, we can conclude that the melting of the ice in a cup of water at room temperature is going to be a spontaneous process. Now this reaction uh, or process, right, it's the melting of ice is not really a chemical reaction so much as a physical change, but we can observe a connection here between the problem we just worked through and the table that we just uh, like qualitatively assessed. What I'm talking about here is our enthalpy is positive. We are working with an endothermic process and endothermic processes may end up being spontaneous, but they may also end up being non-spontaneous. So what's really important here is that we recognize that the entropy change is positive and the temperature is high enough to allow this positive entropy to take over in terms of like the mathematic assessment, the mathematic balance between the enthalpy and the entropy in this case. And so because the entropy was over, or able to take over, this negative sign uh, remains as we calculate delta G, which also ends up being negative. So the melting of ice we know is a process because of the balance of our delta H and our delta S that can end up being non-spontaneous. There is a temperature low enough where we can stop this reaction from moving forward. We can stop the ice from melting. Now using Gibbs free energy, we can find the temperature at which a non-spontaneous reaction becomes spontaneous or a spontaneous reaction becomes non-spontaneous. We're going to use the exact same equation. I'm going to help you guys set this up, but I want you to crunch through the numbers yourself. At what temperature can we stop the spontaneous process of ice melting to water? And if you see where we're going here, you probably already know the answer, but we're going to use Gibbs free energy to also solve for this temperature to demonstrate the power of Gibbs free energy. The temperature at which a spontaneous process becomes non-spontaneous is a delta G equal to zero, right? Because if a delta G is less than zero, well, this is a spontaneous reaction. And if the delta G is greater than zero, this is a non-spontaneous reaction. So the point at which a spontaneous reaction transitions into non-spontaneous and vice versa is going to be when our delta G is exactly equal to zero. All right, so if our delta G is zero, delta G equal to zero, also equal to delta H minus T delta S, you can use the information on the previous slide for delta H and delta S. And I want you guys to solve for this T in our equation right here. All right, so let's take our enthalpy of fusion as well as the entropy corresponding to the ice melting. Insert them into our equation here, the 6.01 kilojoules per mole minus T for temperature times the 0.022 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. And of course, again, all of this is equal to zero. Now, as we rearrange this equation and solve for T, the first step is going to be to subtract the 6.01 kilojoules per mole to the other side. This is gonna be equal to negative T times our delta S, that 0.022 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. Negatives cancel out, giving us positive values. This is good since the temperature is going to be a Kelvin temperature. <laughs> it had better be a positive number because we cannot have a negative temperature in Kelvin. Next, we're going to take both sides and divide them by the entropy. So 6.01 divided by 0.022 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. Kelvin uh, is going to give us a measure of our temperature. So our enthalpy divided by the entropy is going to give us a value equal to T. And our T in this case ends up equaling 273.18 Kelvin by my calculation. And here's where we have to, uh, or we can get a little bit uh, <laughs> critical and evaluate our answer here. 273.18 Kelvin, if we kind of squint our eyes and take rounding into account, is approximately equal to zero degrees Celsius. And what do we know zero degrees Celsius is in relationship to water? 
it's the freezing point. Freezing point. So if you saw where we were going with this, then awesome. <laughs> But if you didn't see where we were going with this, if you're like, well, I don't even know how this would connect to temperature. The freezing and melting, as well as the boiling, the condensing, the subliming, any of these uh, phase changes are temperature dependent and they correspond to potentially spontaneous processes if the temperature is right. So when it comes to an ice cube melting in a glass of water, the way that we stop the ice cube from melting is by lowering its temperature at the very least to the freezing point. Any temperature lower than this is also going to prevent our solid ice from turning to liquid. In fact, if the temperature is low enough, we're actually going to reverse this reaction because all of the liquid is going to start freezing. So at high temperature, high temperature, high T for temperature, we're going to be turning the solid to liquid. And at low temperature, we're going to be turning the liquid back into solid. And so here we can see a more quantitative assessment for what it means to be a relatively high versus a relatively low temperature. Relative means that we are relative to the reaction itself. Some reactions have temperatures where the spontaneous to non-spontaneous switch happens in the thousands of kelvins. Other reactions happen uh, really close to absolute zero. The freezing of water and its relatively high versus low temperature corresponds to the freezing point or zero degrees Celsius. So the temperature with which a reaction can switch from spontaneous to non-spontaneous can happen anywhere, but it's going to be dependent on the reaction itself. And last but not least, <laughs> we're going to uh, discuss another advantage of Gibbs free energy when it comes to assessing the spontaneity of reactions. Um, because Gibbs free energy, our delta G, is explicitly dependent on delta H and delta S, both of which have standardized values, we can actually very easily calculate standardized Gibbs free energy values for a number of compounds. Since we can calculate standardized Gibbs free energies, which is the free energy of a chemical reaction that takes place under our standard conditions. Again, as a reminder, 25 degrees C and one atmosphere. We can also write an equation like the one down below uh, to just really easily again, calculate the standardized uh, Gibbs free energy. So the delta G naught of our reaction is going to be equal to the sum of the Gibbs free energy of our products minus the sum of the Gibbs free energy for our reactants, where again, the N values here correspond to the stoichiometric coefficients inside of the balanced chemical equation. All right, so the form of this equation we have seen now two different times. The first was with enthalpy and the second was with entropy. Now here, it is also <laughs> going to be shown to exist with Gibbs free energy. So if we're working with a chemical reaction and we don't know explicitly what its enthalpy and its entropies are, but we do have a table of Gibbs free energies available to us, as we do, for instance, in Appendix 2 of our text, we can also calculate and predict the spontaneity of a reaction without even needing to explicitly look at the enthalpy, our delta H, and the entropy, our delta S. So that's going to be the last chemical or the last example problem that we work through corresponding to the chemical reaction of the gummy bear sacrifice. So the gummy bear sacrifice is a very uh, famous demo. Um, if you were in class a couple of days ago, we probably performed it. If you were not, um, then I would highly encourage you to look up some videos on YouTube because it is a fireworks show. <laughs> But what we're going to be doing here is calculating the standard Gibbs free energy change for the gummy bear sacrifice reaction. Uh, we can see that the reaction is fairly complicated. What we're really looking at here is a combination of potassium chlorate and sugar. And so long as we are working in an oxygen rich environment, this reaction will progress forward. Our question though is exactly what is the Gibbs uh, free energy and how spontaneous is this reaction? All right, so all of the values that you need can be seen alphabetically arranged in the table down below, our delta G F naughts present. So please use our previous equation to calculate what is the Gibbs free energy for our gummy bear sacrifice.
All right, so without any more delay, let's calculate our delta not of reaction. Now there are a lot of species present here, so there's gonna be a lot to calculate, a lot to work through, but that's okay. We're going to start with our product side first. Again, in this type of equation, it's always products minus uh, reactants. So let's take two times the uh, value for our potassium chloride, which we can see in the table here, is a negative 408.3. And I'm not going to explicitly write the units uh, in my work because there's going to be a lot of numbers here, but all of the units are in kilojoules per mole. All right, we're going to add to this 12, let's see, potassium chloride, done. 12 times that of uh, carbon dioxide, we can see here is negative 394.4. Cross that off plus 11 times the Gibbs free energy for our water in liquid phase, which is a negative 237.2, again, kilojoules per mole. And we are going to subtract out two times our potassium chlorate here. Uh, the potassium chlorate in the table is down below. Two times, negative 289.9, cross that out. We're going to add just one of our Gibbs free energy values for our sugar, and we can see that this is a very large number indeed, 1544.3 kilojoules per mole. And last but not least, we're going to add to this 9 for each of our oxygens times 0. All right, so the zero being uh, present in our Gibbs free energy calculation can really be attributed to the uh, like relative values of the enthalpies. So just like how enthalpy was found to be relative to the elements in their natural state, like for example, gaseous oxygen, this led to a zero enthalpy. The same thing is seen here for our Gibbs free energy. So because Gibbs is directly related to the enthalpy, that's where this zero value is coming from. So now we have an equation with a bunch of numbers to crunch, and it's very easy to lose some of the data, some of the values along the way. And so our Gibbs free energy, uh, just to watch out for all of those negatives and coefficients, ends up being equal to negative 6,034.5 kilojoules per mole. All right, so this reaction is spontaneous because our Gibbs free energy is negative, but not only that, it is very spontaneous. We have a very large negative number here, which again, if you remember, or if you look up what the uh, gummy bear sacrifice reaction looks like, this makes perfect sense. The reaction is incredibly vigorous, lots of light, lots of heat being released. This is a reaction that once it gets started is going to spontaneously and rapidly and aggressively move from reactants to products. And that is going to be it for the day. So uh, <laughs> not only that, but this is it for the chapter. Chapter 15 um, is finished. These example problems here, I just realized have typos. These should be 15.5.1 uh, to 15.5.4. Excuse me for that. Uh, but yeah, here we have a couple of example problems pertaining to Gibbs free energy, um, not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively, kind of making an assessment as to whether or not a reaction will be spontaneous at high versus low temperatures and what that means to the reaction. If you have any questions though, please do not hesitate to reach out and ask those questions. I love clarifying. Uh, if you have any homework, please double check and do your homework. And until next time, class is dismissed. <laughs>